Although not well known in the western parts of the world, Russian filmmaker Yuri Norstein is considered by many to be one of the greatest animators of all time. He also hasn't produced a complete work in 40 years. Despite the lapse of output, he hasn't been inactive. With the collaboration of his wife and fellow animator Francesca Yabusova, the two have been working inside a small rental flat which they've renovated into a workshop after being fired from their animation studio to adapt a feature-length film called The Overcoat, or as it's called in Russian, Shinyel. With both of them 80 years old, they have been working on this film for over half their lives, giving The Overcoat the record for longest production of any animated feature in history. The two work so closely and with such unified vision that they've been described as a single artist. Together, they set out on their daily task to draw, paint, cut out, and bring to life a stop-motion film of unprecedented detail, knowing all the while it will likely never be finished. <laughs> This is the story of The Overcoat and its decades-long production. When Yuri and Francesca began production on The Overcoat in 1981, they didn't know they'd embarked on a project which would consume the remainder of their lives. If I'd known how far it would take me, Yuri said decades later in a 2019 interview, I wouldn't have touched it. They were celebrated artists in their creative prime, known mostly for short, abstract films of a cerebral and surreal quality unique in Russian animation. Their longest film to date has been their most recent, 1979's Skaza Skazak, clocking in at just under half an hour. But for The Overcoat, they're aiming for feature length, 65 minutes, more than double their longest film to date. Yuri assumes his normal role as writer, director, and animator. He relays to Francesca the character movements he wishes to capture, often by demonstrating the actions himself, and she sets out to create all of the film's visual assets, both background and foreground. She has an ability which is absolutely unachievable for me, Yuri says of his wife, of turning an image into something that flies. For a single character, Francesca fills a drawer with nothing but eyes, laminated on celluloid, each expressing a different emotion. Another drawer is filled with hands in every conceivable pose, and another, single drops of rain meant to drip from the character's clothes. And of course, the film's titular overcoat, rendered countless times. Yuri carefully adjusts it all from frame to frame, creating the most delicate of gestures. He's known in animation circles as the Golden Snail for his intense attention to detail, and glacial production pace most wouldn't dream of tolerating. The result is work of consummate quality, but the price they pay for it is time. And for the overcoat, even the rest of their lives may not be enough. As the years progress, people from across the world come to preview the film that Yuri and Francesca have devoted themselves to making. When looking at their body of work, it's clear they've been ramping up to something big. Their style, which defined Russian stop-motion animation earlier in their career, has been evolving in complexity with each project. Each release has been more acclaimed than the last, but for much of their career they were not well-liked or trusted by the Soviet government, who had alienated them from their lifelines of support. They'd won many film awards, such as the Los Angeles Olympics Arts Festival Prize for Greatest Animated Film of All Time, but they were not permitted to travel internationally in order to accept them. Soviet newspapers were discouraged from writing about them, hindering their popularity from growing to its natural height. In the moments they were offered help, often from other filmmakers, stubbornness, pride, or perhaps even self-sabotage led Yuri to refuse it. And so, arguably the most celebrated animators in Russian history have found themselves laboring alone on a film that will likely never see the light of day. So who are Yuri Norstein and Francesca Yarbusova, and how do they find themselves here? Yuri and Francesca met in 1967 and married the same year. 
They were both recent art school graduates who'd found employment at Soyuz Mult Film, the Soviet Union's most prominent animation studio located in the heart of Moscow. Soyuz Mult Film was where they would begin to perfect the techniques that would become the envy of animators everywhere. But at the beginning of their career, their work was not creatively fulfilling. Early assignments alternated between instructional cautionary tales for children such as 1969's Children and Matches. and propagandistic films meant to glorify the Soviet Union. They did quality work knowing it was the only way to earn enough trust to be given creative control of their films, but it was a struggle. I hated myself, the films, the studio, Yuri said of their early days at Soyuz Mult Film. But however frustrating, these apprenticeship years were instrumental in developing their craft. To this day, Yuri and Francesca use a type of stop motion they learned at Soyuz Mult Film called cutout animation, a technique they describe as primitive and plebeian, or sometimes just the Soviet technique. Figures are drawn, cut out, and puppeteered in between shots to create movement, creating a style that has been described as paper dolls photographed in 3D. Most animators at Soyuz Mult Film use small hinges that would allow the character's limbs and joints to be easily adjusted from one frame to the next. It was a convenient method, and more importantly for the studio, it was fast. But Yuri hated how unnatural it looked. As he began to gain confidence in his role at the studio, Yuri would shock his co-workers by ripping out the tiny hinges, insisting on a much more time-consuming method of redrawing and recutting the character's hands, legs, and facial expressions, as many times and in as many poses as it took to look natural. Few artists at Soyuz Mult Film had the stomach for this production technique, but Francesca was one of them. And once Yuri had enough experience under his belt to be given the helm for his films, he chose Francesca as his art director, and their legacy truly began. Arguably, the first true preview of their collaborative potential came in 1974, with a short piece about two birds, a heron and a crane, and their struggle to find the right moment in their lives to pursue a relationship with one another. Compared to the other films Soyuz Mult Film released that year, Heron and Crane was a visual and technical marvel. In fact, Yuri's animation fluidity and Francesca's vivid scenery made it one of the most impressive films to ever have come out of the studio. But their follow-up, 1975's Hedgehog in the Fog, an astonishing 10-minute film about a hedgehog who gets derailed from meeting up with a friend and drawn into a foggy underworld after glimpsing a white horse on the horizon. <gasps> was an even bigger success, both artistically and commercially, earning Yuri and Francesca top animation awards. Many of the issues that would later plague their creative relationship hadn't yet fully formed, and their most persistent source of stress during these early years was their production pace. Soyuz Mult Film was accustomed to releasing around 40 films per year, and having a director spend an entire year making a single 10-minute film was straining the patience of the studio executives. But they couldn't deny the cultural impact these films were having, and there was a sense of being in the halcyon days at Soyuz Mult Film, with Yuri and Francesca on their way to international stardom. But there was a problem forming, and one that would persist throughout the remainder of their career. The morals of their films were ambiguous, and in the 20th century Soviet Union, ambiguity in the arts wasn't tolerated. At the time, it was said that the Soviet Union was entering a period of relative artistic tolerance. Coming out of the Stalin era, the country experienced a phase known as the Thaw, in which censorship was more relaxed than it had ever been during the previous decades. But although artists were no longer arrested for producing work with questionable messages, free expression was still largely discouraged during the thaw. For much of Yuri and Francesca's career, the Soviet Union was dominated by a government-enforced artistic style known as socialist realism. Socialist realism was easily identified by its absence of ambiguity, and offered only simple stories with clear meanings, meant to extol the virtues of the Soviet way of life. 
Despite its name, the art of socialist realism made no attempt to be realistic. Heroes were discouraged from having vices. Sex was forbidden from being portrayed or even suggested. A popular and widely encouraged character trait of a socialist realism protagonist was the patriotic desire to put in a hard day's work. Literature was arguably the most scrutinized medium, and subversive novels during this time were written, quote, for the desk drawer. As the authors acknowledged, they were unlikely to be published. Live-action films were also regularly subject to audits. Script supervisor roles within movie studios were said to have been filled by KGB agents, whose only goal was to reject potentially seditious content. Animation was considered to be a bit of a blind spot for censors who assumed the corner of the industry contained nothing but harmless children's stories. But in 1968, Sayu's Malt film had produced The Glass Harmonica, an enigmatic film about the need for artistic liberation in the face of oppressive bureaucracy. <laughs> It was the first animated film to be banned in the Soviet Union, and a signal to artists everywhere that no medium was safe from the censors. It didn't take much to arouse the suspicion of the censors for socialist realism, who'd had their eyes on Yuri and Francesca for years. Their films, innocent and playful on the surface, certainly weren't overtly seditious, but they weren't noticeably patriotic either. But in the late 1970s, Yuri and Francesca completed their most ambitious and ambiguous film to date, and it was one which would simultaneously hinder the advancement of their careers, while solidifying their legacies as two of the greatest animators of all time. By the late 1970s, the distaste Yuri and Francesca felt toward the typical Sayuzmolt film filmmaking style and the socialist realism propaganda that drove it had become their prime motivator for innovation. They set out to make something Yuri described as, quote, a protest against the animation of that time. They had two young children when work on the new film began, which drove them to reflect on their own childhoods and their experience of everyday life in Moscow toward the end of World War II. You need a great talent to live in peacetime, Yuri said. For in wartime, everything is intense. Everything is precisely defined, clear. Everyone knows what to do and how to live. But during peacetime, it's easy in your everyday life to gradually lose your way. The film they made was titled Skaza Skazak, or as it's called in English, Tale of Tales. And those who have seen it more than 50 times claim it still retains its mystery. The film's setting would combine elements of Yuri and Francesca's childhoods. To the chagrin of the censors, it would not be a flattering portrayal. Yuri grew up in a communal flat called a communalka, which his family shared with several other families. Yuri, his parents, and older brother shared a bedroom. While the kitchen and bathroom were shared among everyone in the flat, families and strangers alike. In comparison with other communal flats, we were better off, Yuri said of the communalka. We had five families, that means about 20 people in the flat, but above us on the first floor there was a flat with 12 or so families. The corridor which connected the rooms doubled as a storage area for the family's belongings and a place for cooking. With only a single 25 watt bulb to light the entire space, one could barely see in front of them. The heat, noise, and smells, Yuri said, were terrible. We had no money and had to economize with everything. Yuri remembers when he was four years old, his aunt lost her newborn baby, and she gave Yuri her breast milk so it wouldn't go to waste. As Yuri fell asleep every night, his mother would sing to him a lullaby about a little gray wolf who would come to snatch him from his crib and take him away. It was a traditional lullaby, but it adopted a sinister meaning when considering the Norsteins were Jewish. And with the Nazis already occupying parts of the Soviet Union, the threat of capture and deportation was ever present. Despite it all, Yuri remembers feeling happiness, and one crucial question he hoped to answer with the film was, where did the happiness come from?
Francesca designed the house in the film as an amalgamation of Yuri's childhood communalka and her own childhood home, where she spent her days either drawing with her mother or helping her father catch and catalog insects for his experiments. Like all of Francesca's work, Tale of Tales is rich with carefully detailed flora and fauna, of which her knowledge is said to be encyclopedic, and she would create a sense of depth in every scene by layering it onto a multiplane camera. While most animators at Sayu's Malt Film were drawing their backgrounds onto a single 2D sheet, Yuri and Francesca would build their backgrounds using real physical distance. They'd place the sky, clouds, and trees lower on the multiplane, with assets in the foreground resting above, closer to the camera. В данном случае здесь на каждом ярусе какие-то куски декорации для того, чтобы получить глубокий эффект по глубокого кадра. Bizarre techniques such as photographing real raindrops to meticulously cut out and animate onto dripping leaves, or lighting fires in the studio in order to achieve this shot, only increased the divide between what most animators were willing to do for their films and what Yuri and Francesca insisted were necessary. Skaskas Kazak was the most high effort work they'd ever done, but the effort took its toll, and Yuri and Francesca nearly sacrificed their marriage and their sanity in order to achieve it. Yuri was growing increasingly difficult to work with. He felt a constant urge to outperform their previous films, and when things didn't come together as he'd envisioned, he later admitted to shouting blame at Francesca. They were destroying each other, wrote a friend of the couple. Fran was going to hang herself twice, if I remember correctly. Yuri was banging his head against the wall, and out of this suffering came the film. As per decree from the State Committee for Cinematography, filmmakers were not permitted to write the scripts for their own films unless they were a part of the appropriate writers' union, which Yuri and Francesca were not. So, when considering potential screenwriters for Skaza Skazak, they decided to make a choice that was, in itself, an act of defiance against the censors. Ludmila Petrashevskia was a controversial Soviet novelist and playwright. Some of her more recent books are titled There Once Lived a Woman Who Tried to Kill Her Neighbor's Baby and There Once Lived a Girl Who Seduced Her Sister's Husband and He Hanged Himself, Love Stories. Like Yuri and Francesca, she made no attempt to follow the artistic principles of socialist realism. Most of her work had been banned, with her plays performed secretly in small theaters. The screenplay for Skazas Gazak that Ludmilla submitted to the State Committee for Cinematography was approved, but what they didn't realize was that the script was a decoy. The simple story described in the script of how, quote, friendship and comradeship stands above all else drew barely a passing resemblance to the cryptic fever dream that was ultimately Skazis Gazak. Once the film was unveiled, Philip Yermish, the chairman for the State Committee of Cinematography, was not impressed. He felt the film's ambiguity left room for dangerous interpretations that might be construed as a critique on the Soviet way of life. At Sayu's Malt Film, Yermash said, they've produced something that does not correspond at all to the principles of socialist realism. Yermash had replaced the previous chairman only a few years prior, and he was there to crack down on the Soviet film industry's, quote, lack of ideological purposefulness. He is described in the book Behind the Soviet Screen as a complete cynic who hates films and filmmakers, and is only interested in power for power's sake. Yermash ordered a letter to be sent to Yuri with a list of significant edits he wanted to make to the film before release. But having Ludmilla at their side seemed to embolden Yuri in the face of the censors, and he refused. The studio had thought he'd scare me with that piece of paper because he himself lived by those rules, Yuri said. He was amazed and even frightened when I refused to change the film. Yermash was ready to issue a ban on the screening of Skazas Gazak, the first ban of a Soviet animated film since the Glass Harmonica over 10 years prior. 
but a secret alliance of filmmakers who opposed the censors was beginning to form, and they quickly lobbied for Yuri and Francesca to be awarded the USSR State Prize for their outstanding work in animation. And with big names such as celebrated animator Fedor Ketruk to vouch for them, the State Prize was awarded. If Yuri and то сказка сказок так и бы осталась запрещена до 86 года. Я абсолютно в этом уверена, потому что ей ничего не светит. It would have appeared hypocritical for the state to ban the work of artists who just been awarded the prestigious state prize. And so, begrudgingly, Skaza Skazak was released to the public. Yuri and Francesca had won the fight, and after nearly 50 years of socialist realism in the Soviet Union, there was a sense that artists who banded together to rebel could potentially bring it to an end. But there were still ways for the censors to hinder artists who did not conform, and now Yuri and Francesca were a target. And what the two hadn't yet realized was that their biggest challenge lay ahead. Following the release of Skaza Skazak, Yuri and Francesca were eager to begin work on their next film. They'd begun to develop a bit of a reputation for lengthy and problematic productions, but the executives at Soyuz Molt Film still seemed to appreciate their ambition. So when Yuri and Francesca pitched their idea, they were granted funding and studio space. The film was called The Overcoat, and its characters and plot would be based on a short story of the same title by Russian novelist Nikolai Gogol. The story follows a compulsive and solitary copy editor named Akaki Akakevich. At work, he copies ledgers, notices, and any other text put in front of him. At home, he doesn't know what to do with himself other than to continue copying, using whatever random bits of script he finds lying around his house until he falls asleep. He nearly freezes each day as he's walking to and from his office, and his overcoat is so threadbare that his tailor declares it a lost cause. So Akikevich saves up his rubles for a year, often going without food, in order to have a replacement made. Once his tailor finishes the new overcoat, Akakevich finds it so warm and beautiful that it transforms his life. Published nearly a century before the beginning of socialist realism, the overcoat offered neither a flattering nor patriotic portrayal of Soviet life, but it was considered a major part of the country's literary canon, and it had been adapted by Russian filmmakers before, so the idea wasn't met with much pushback from the censors. It was to be Yuri and Francesca's first feature-length film, and Soyuz Molt Film gave them six years to complete it. But their process had become fraught with creative disagreement. Skaza Skazak's production had nearly broken the two of them, and with the overcoat, they would sink even deeper into the quagmire. The six-year deadline would quickly seem almost laughable. Francesca worked with a sense of perfectionism, which became a source of contention. Yuri wanted her drawings to look half-finished, and he would encourage her to draw quickly, almost slapdash, so that the figures would contain a sense of spontaneity. I'm always telling her not to draw perfectly finished pictures as if for an exhibition, Yuri said in a 1990 interview. What we want is something that will develop further when it's on the screen. If there's no later development, the film will be dead. Здесь не нужно соблюдать такую математическую дистиллированную точность. Должен быть художественный хаос. Francesca questioned her role as Yuri's artistic director, saying in interviews that she was tortured by the thought of being the wrong artist. But they'd spent nearly their whole careers together, and it was clear that no one other than she could tolerate working with Yuri. Yuri's desire for spontaneity penetrated nearly every aspect of the filmmaking process. He'd ask Ludmilla to again join him as screenwriter, but her role was nominal, as Yuri no longer seemed to even want to work from a script. With a script, Yuri said, you lose the most important thing, the immediacy of the poetry, the immediacy of the action. I think a film should be constantly changing. Yuri was trading scripting and planning for a sense of, quote, aliveness, which made key aspects of production, like budgeting, nearly impossible. And instead of inching closer to completion, Yuri and Francesca found themselves pushing the goalpost ever further away. But the work was stunning. No cutout animation had ever had such precision and fluidity of movement. 
Although previously disgusted by Sayu's mold film's over-reliance on hinges, Yuri and Francesca now saw fit to incorporate them, not as a shortcut, but as a way to mimic human dexterity. And unlike their past films, which were vivid and rich in color, the overcoat was to be illustrated in bleak grayscale. Meanwhile, the world outside of the Soviet Union was beginning to notice Skaza's Kazakh. When the Olympics Arts Festival was held in Los Angeles in 1984, a panel of judges voted it the best animated film of all time. American media was baffled that their Disney films didn't take home the top awards, and such classics as Snow White and the Seven Dwarves had been beaten by a 30-minute Soviet cartoon that barely anyone had heard of. But for Yuri and Francesca, life didn't improve. They were not permitted to travel to Los Angeles to accept the award, and it's been written that during the ceremony, a KGB agent was there to accept it on their behalf. This was a somewhat common technique used to suppress seditious content that was gaining international popularity. Notably, in 1958, Soviet author Boris Pasternak was banned from accepting the Nobel Prize for his novel Dr. Zhivago, which at the time wasn't even allowed to be published in its native country. But not only did the achievement of having created the greatest animated film of all time do little to earn the respect of their government, Sayu's Molt film fired Yuri and Francesca from their studio once the 1986 deadline for the overcoat arrived, and only 10 minutes of completed film could be delivered, a fraction of its anticipated runtime. They were arguably the best in the world at their craft, and yet it seemed to mean nothing. They had been abandoned, and if they were to continue, they would only have each other. And for Yuri and Francesca, these conditions would prove to be paralyzing. By the mid-1980s, the signals to leave behind the shallow predictability of socialist realism had grown too strong for the USSR to ignore. Artists and audiences alike were demanding change. Although the Soviet Union had moved away from outright banning films, Philip Yermesh still exercised control over filmmakers by manipulating public opinion. Film directors who remained in good standing with the State Committee for Cinematography were all but guaranteed positive reviews from film critics. Those not in good standing were targeted for heavy criticism, and film critics who failed to judge films by these designations were in danger of being fired on the grounds of, quote, ideological error. But Soviet audiences were not stupid, and negative reviews for a film often led to a higher attendance as people became intrigued by what the censors didn't want them to see. By 1986, it became clear that enforcing socialist realism had the inverse of its intended cultural effect. Philip Yermesh was fired from his role as the head of the State Committee for Cinematography on the grounds that he was a, quote, barrier to creative expression. Previously banned films suddenly started playing in Soviet theaters for the first time to enthusiastic audiences. This period became known as the Perestroika, and despite being a source of uncertainty for the future of the nation, many Russian artists saw it as a liberation. But while others were celebrating, Yuri and Francesca were alone with their unfinished film. Each morning, they'd wake up to the overcoat, sitting in spools and drawers. Drawings of Akaki Akakevich, along with his various poses they needed to render, loomed over their workspace. They assembled their own multi-plane camera station, developed their own film, and built their own sets, turning the overcoat into a completely independent project. But the more challenging things became, the more effort they seemed to put into the film. Yuri would occasionally discover a new technique while animating a scene, then realize he needed to go back and redo everything he'd done before it, in light of his new discovery. And by the 1990s, their standards had become sadistically high. Minuscule movements like the pouring of tea from a mug or the removal of a robe required untold hours. They had years of work ahead of them, and progress had slowed to a crawl. 
Their personal problems persisted as the boundary between their marriage and the overcoat began to erode. While Yuri had authority over Francesca at Sayusmolt Film, in their house and in their rental space, they were equals. And as work continued, Yuri complained that he felt less like Francesca's director and more like just her husband, a feeling he described as, quote, a terrible hindrance. But the underlying issue was that the two of them were trying to make a film that would normally warrant an entire studio production. They were largely without help, aside from friends who would occasionally come over to help operate the multi-plane camera, which required an additional set of hands. But funding was a constant source of anxiety, as more often than not, Yuri and Francesca had none. The perestroika had liberated artist creativity, but it also restructured how subsidies were distributed among the Soviet Union's disciplines. Filmmakers, especially ones without a studio, were left to fend for themselves. Other Soviet animators took jobs abroad, and many early 90s American cartoons were directed by Russians who'd relocated after the perestroika. Yuri and Francesca were given similar opportunities, with North American studios eager to finance their work on the overcoat if they were willing to relocate, but they refused to leave. Their reasoning wasn't based on a sentimentality for their birthplace of Moscow, but rather a notion that the overcoat could only be created amid feelings of discomfort and uncertainty. Yuri drew the following analogy. Once as a child, I fell off my bike and grazed my elbow. I couldn't feel the rest of my body at all, only the elbow. And it's like that with work, you should only work with the injured part, and you can only get that feeling at home. Yuri seemed to subscribe to a belief that suffering somehow purified their art, and if things were made too easy, the work would lose something. This asceticism seemed to penetrate nearly all aspects of their process. Yuri, for example, refuses to use a computer to assist in any stage of their production, with the only explanation being that the idea of it makes him sick. Why do I not use a computer? Now everything is done on the computer. All. So I think I'm the last wild person who в диких шкурах с дубиной в руке ходит, уже разговаривать не умеет и только орёт. Вот я, вот кто я сегодня. They would continue, quote, without computers, without everything. To help with funding, they opened their workshop for weekly tours, where they would sell prints and postcards of their artwork, but this hardly covered their expenses. So they would take commissioned work, such as this 30-second sugar commercial. But their perfectionism and complicated working relationship would cause these side projects to delay overcoat production for sometimes years at a time. They spent 18 months animating this short segment for a children's television show. And this two minute long piece for a Japanese compilation called Winter Days took them nearly a year to complete. Their work was more impressive than ever, but by 2004, they'd added only 15 minutes of footage to the overcoat, bringing the total to 25 minutes. They had been in production for 24 years and were barely over a third of the way to their desired runtime. Their name still inspired reverence in their fellow animators, and Nick Park of Wallace and Gromit fame offered the two of them funding, but Yuri would only accept a box of light bulbs. It's reported that financiers will regularly visit their studios and offer them the money they need to complete the film, but Yuri gained a reputation for literally running from the conversation and hiding in the other room. A close friend of the couple summed it up by saying, the only things Yuri is afraid of are the things that might really help him. So at Yuri's insistence, the greatest Russian animators of all time would trudge along on their own, with the unfinished overcoat an ever-present part of their lives. And slowly, they would grow accustomed to the reality that they may never finish it, and that not finishing it was, in many ways, a choice. When Yuri said that uncomfortable conditions were necessary for the creation of the overcoat, it's worth considering that he was referring to the sense of tragedy and unfairness present in the original text. 
During the second half of the story, Akaki Akakevich attends a company party where his new overcoat has made him the center of attention. But on his way home, he's mugged and his overcoat stolen. He pleads with authorities to help him recover it, but nobody will help him. Without the overcoat, Akakevich is back to being no one. Now, once again vulnerable to the cold, Akakevich soon catches fever and dies, and his ghost haunts the streets of St. Petersburg, snatching overcoats from any who pass him by. <laughs> The story of Nikolai Gogol himself has an equally tragic ending. He sabotaged his final manuscript, a follow-up to his acclaimed novel Dead Souls, which he'd been working on for years, by throwing it into a fire during a brief psychosis. He fell into a depression, stopped eating, and died alone in his bed a week later. With Yuri and Francesca's previous films, from the light-hearted Heron and Crane to the solemnly optimistic Skazas Gazak, there was always the drive to outperform their past selves. But there didn't seem to be any element of purposely making things more difficult for the sake of artistic purification. But it's clear they view the overcoat differently. And despite the fact that some of their short films under Sayusmalt film continue to be celebrated as some of the greatest of all time, the Overcoat's 40-year-long and counting production cycle is what they're on track to be most known for. A common criticism of their legacy is that Yuri tends to get the bulk of recognition for their work. With Yuri holding the title of film director, the fact that Francesca's contribution is equally important is often overlooked. Some argue that this is due to Francesca being a shy, private person who rarely gives interviews or public appearances, who perhaps even prefers her husband to be the face of their films. Francesca is a mystery to me, Yuri said of his wife. The more I get to know her, the less I know. But as time passes, Francesca has become a larger part of the conversation. It's impossible to ignore the artist who hand draws and hand paints every object that appears in their films. And when the 2018 President's Prize for the Field of Literature and Art was awarded, it was Francesca alone who received it. Yuri, by contrast, appears to enjoy the fame, and the available interviews and lectures he's given seem to number in the hundreds. But there's still a sense that the two of them never quite achieved the public attention that their work deserves. They became popular in Japan after filmmaker Hayao Miyazaki spoke out in admiration for their work. But aside from Russians who grew up with Tale of Tales and Hedgehog in the Fog as part of their childhood, not many are familiar with the two of them. It's likely that the censors of socialist realism, who suppress their popularity both locally and internationally, are in part to blame. But it's mostly due to their never having finished a feature-length film. As historically significant as their contribution to the field of animation has been, there's the nagging feeling that it's incomplete. The experience of working on a single film for 40 years is something virtually no one else can relate to. But other examples of decade-long animation productions, while rare, are not unheard of. A Hungarian film titled The Tragedy of Man, which chronicles the entire rise and fall of humanity, began production in 1983 and didn't see a release until 2011. Like the overcoat, setbacks due to the restructuring of government funding as well as an ambitious animation style were culprits for the delay. But easily the most well-known example is an English film titled The Thief and the Cobbler. At the time of its release in 1993, it took the record for longest film production at 29 years. Similar to Yuri and Francesca, director Richard Williams took outside film projects in order to fund it, which elongated the film's early production. But disputes over the intellectual property rights of the characters, ever-increasing animation complexity, and an economic recession caused this film to run significantly behind schedule and over budget. The Thief and the Cobbler was ultimately taken away from its director, and a theatrical version was cobbled together by a studio producer. 
It released to poor reviews and even poorer attendance. It wasn't until over a decade later that audiences began to appreciate The Thief and the Cobbler, when an edit of the film that was truer to its original vision surfaced. But even this version is clearly unfinished. From far south of Gaza, a bountiful maid from Mombasa. The Thief and the Cobbler had such a lengthy production that many voice actors and animators passed away before they saw the film's release. This happened during The Overcoat as well. Close friend and cinematographer Alexander Zukovsky, who would regularly show up to the Norstein studio to help with filming, passed away in 1999. Aside from Ludmilla, Zukovsky seemed to be one of Yuri and Francesca's few collaborators who'd understood their vision and could gel with their eccentric production habits. They described the loss as devastating, both professionally and personally. Other examples include The King and the Mockingbird, with its 30-year production marred initially by the bankruptcy of its studio and later by a lack of investor interest, and another Russian stop-motion animated film titled Hoff Maniata, which took its director 17 years to complete under Yuri and Francesca's old studio, Sayuzmalt Film. Sayuzmalt Film, like most Russian film studios, faced a period of economic downturn in the years following the collapse of the Soviet Union. While the studio ultimately recovered, many of the films in production during that time did not. The production span for The Overcoat is much longer than these other films, in most cases by 10 years or more. And while these titles were eventually released in one form or another, The Overcoat remains in production to this day. In a cryptic 2015 interview, Yuri stated that while the film is still his main focus, he no longer thinks about whether he'll have the strength needed to finish it. The two of them are in their 80s now, and the overcoat is not even close to completion. Funding has continued to be offered by various sources, even from such government entities as the Russian Ministry of Culture. But Yuri's responses have become increasingly predictable. You can't take from someone who doesn't give a damn about you, Yuri said of his decision to decline the help. But even unfinished, the overcoat is a significant work of art. In an effort to demonstrate the uncanny possibilities of their unique style of animation, Yuri and Francesca have taken on a project so ambitious that it required half their lives to realize it. Their persistence in the face of an ever-diminishing likelihood of completion has itself become an aspect of the film. And whether or not the overcoat is ever finished, Yuri and Francesca will close their animation careers just as they began, working together to create something that could only come from the two of them. I don't know what I'll get in the answer. Actually, about that, what kind of explanation, I always tell the same story. When the man in a crazy house is sitting a patient and что-то делает, а его <coughs> приятель спрашивает, ты чем занимаешься? Он говорит, письмо пишу. Что, не видишь письмо? Ну и кому ты его пишешь? Себе пишу. И, и что там пишешь? Не знаю, что не получал. Мне кажется, что здесь хорошо. Абсолютно. I'd like to thank NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Have you been trying to watch Tarkovsky's Andrei Rublev on a streaming service, but you live in the 1960s Soviet Union and it's been blocked by the censors for socialist realism? NordVPN allows you to change your virtual location with a single click, no matter where you are. Sorry, Khrushchev. NordVPN offers its users peace of mind by protecting their internet activity and online privacy. It hides your IP address, masks your location, allows you to use public Wi-Fi hotspots safely, protects against unsecure apps, and gives you access to your favorite content not regularly available in your location. NordVPN is also fast, and you won't have to compromise speed in order to take advantage of its protection and privacy. So visit nordvpn.com slash atrocityguide and use the promo code atrocityguide to get a free four months added to your two-year plan. And once again, thank you to NordVPN. Their support allows me to invest more time, energy, and resources into the channel and hopefully bring you all better videos. And thank you for watching. <laughs>